Do, dobro večer svima. I will fake English and so you can follow me. Uh, good evening everybody. Um, as Nemanja said, I'm not a mathematician, so I feel a kind of funny. I'm a psychologist and we like to talk about our, our childhood. And I really have to share an emotion with you. When I, when I was in high school, um, we, it was my first trip to the guitar show in Zayatar. I don't know, you're probably aware of it, it's still happening today. And you can imagine my surprise when I wanted to go for the first time in my life to a great rock and roll concert, rock and roll show. And on the program, the one of the authors listed was Maya Nikolic. And we, uh, some of you know the authors. So now I feel like Maya Nikolic on the rock and roll show. So please <laughs> forgive me for doing so. I'll try not to be that uh, as much as I can, actually. So uh, you might wonder what a psychologist is doing at a math, math show. Um, you might wonder what do mathematicians need psychologists because they kind of act funny sometimes or speak funny, nobody understands them. Uh, but also psychologists actually need mathematicians and mathematics a lot. Uh, as any science, in order to understand the things that go on in our heads, we often use mathematics. What I'm actually going to talk about, thanks to this intro of uh, David Bowie, is I'm going to, uh, as soon as my pointer starts working, I probably got the wrong, but no, it's working, sorry. <laughs> or there's a magical hand changing there for me. So I'm actually going to talk about the perceived space. Uh, so I don't have the pointer working. Ah, oh, it's working. So I'm going to talk about the perceived space. Uh, it looks spacey, but I'm not going to talk about astronomy. Actually, I'm going to talk about mental representation of spatial relations of object and their characteristics. Sounds wonderful, right? <laughs> Just imagine in your head, you have a space. You have a representation of everything around you, what's going on. Um, I might quote Donald Duck, or Paya Patak, if somebody doesn't know who's, who the Donald is. Uh, what's the big idea about it? Why do we need this representation of space? Just imagine you're judging distance between the cars. You want to park. It happens a lot, you miss, right? It's one dimensional, you need the distance. You, you usually do it right. Sometimes you don't. Just imagine the more romantic story. You say, if the shoe fits, you find the love of your life and you're judging the shoe. What you're actually judging is the surface, right? It's two dimensional. You need, you need it, the right surface for the leg. Or you want to pour a coffee in the morning in a cup. You're actually judging the, the volume of the cup. It's three dimensional. All these judgments and estimates are actually done based on your mental representation of a shoe, of a leg, of cars, of cup, and coffee. Imagine how this space might look like if something funny happens to you. Sorry for pouring my back to you. If you come to the talk and, just, sorry for this <laughs> erotic part, um, just imagine I'm holding a lecture. You, you guys look really, really funny now. It's, everything is quite different, and I can't do the talk like this. I'm bad at juggling and also in this. What happened to my space and my representation of you? It actually went very, very hard and bizarre. This is actually a painting called the toucher illusion when you flip somebody's face. So, I'm going to talk to you about the distance perception. So space involves, I'm estimating the distances, right? How far something is. Why this might be the problem? Just imagine this is your eye, and just imagine these two points. What they do is actually they project into your eye. It, it, it sounds like matrix, right? Your heads project into my eyes. It's romantic also. But what's the problem? These two points, which are in the same direction, actually project on the same point in your eye. Meaning that those two points activate the same cell in your eye. What's the problem? How does my mind know which one is which? If this cell is activated, this might come from the point A or the point B. We don't know that. How do we know which point activated our cell? We have various cues, and that's where geometry helps us. 
It helps us a lot. One of those, just one of those cues is really famous. Painters use it a lot. Just imagine this picture of a church. It's a photograph. It's a Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome. The church. It's not a nice church, right? It's kind of... And can you imagine the parallel lines here? You see the parallel lines? Where do they go? They all go to the same single point here. Okay? So what happens actually in the projection, all parallel lines go into a single point. My brain knows based on this projection that this point is far away. If you are a realistic painter, you want to do the same. This is not the photograph, this is the painting. How will you align parallel lines? You need to point, point, put them in the same spot, right? So, they all come to the same spot. Like very skillful painters, this. They, they have the linear perspective. May, may, they make it well. But sometimes, geometry does funny things to us. Sometimes our brain doesn't follow simple mathematic rules. Geometry or, or other rules. Let me show you one bizarre painting by René Magritte. Um, if you see in this painting, you see it, you don't have a problem with it. I hope you didn't see this uh, guy on a horse alive, right, in, in front of you. It, it, it would be really strange if you saw it. What's really bizarre about this painting, take a look at here. In this part, you see a horse in front of a tree. Here, you see a tree in front of a wood. So let's say, horse in front of a tree, tree in front of a wood, Horse in front of a wood. But no, it's a wood in front of a horse. What does mathematics tell us? If A is larger than B, B larger than C, then A is supposed to be larger than C. But for our mind, it doesn't have to work. So sometimes it follows simple mathematical rules in geometry. Sometimes it doesn't. When it doesn't, when it breaks them, we have something which is called illusions. And let me introduce you to the few very famous one. The first one is, I'm going to talk about, is called Miller-Lear illusion. It's usually called Miller-Lear illusion because of the wrong naming of this guy here. Look at the two lines, the red one and the green one. You see the green one? I'm bad with colors. A is equal to B, right? And A looks equal to B. Physically, trust me, they are equal. Don't worry. I'm not going to fool you yet. But what happens when I add this to them? A is still equal to B, but they don't look the same. Your mind doesn't follow the simple geometrical rule of judging the, the sizes. These ends here actually prolong or shorten the lines for your mind. There's another example of wrong estimated size. It's called horizontal vertical illusion, but it's actually not up to that. Do you see this line? Do you see it, guys? Yeah, <laughs> you see it. Look at this one. Which one looks longer? Looks, red one, right, it's obvious. They are physically the same. But now look, the red one looks longer than this one. What can I do next? I can just take the the gray one, and add another one. Now the gray one looks longer than the green one. Okay? You're good at this. Right, really good. Now, then just take the green one. Now, the yellow one looks shorter than the green one. Green one is longer, right? Now, of course, I'm going to take the yellow one and add the red one. Now the yellow looks longer. So, what happens if I place all of them in your perception Red is larger than this one, and then red is smaller than all this one. Physically, they are all actually the same. So, your mind doesn't actually follow those rules. Uh, there can be more fun examples. If you look at the street, do you see the containers here, the trash cans? And you see that images of these are a bit smaller. It's perspective, right? They have to be smaller, but trust me, you have no idea how smaller they are. You think it's smaller, but let me take one of them, cut it, and paste it somewhere else. 
Look at when I take this one, A, and place it here. It's the same. This is the one. Did you imagine this one to be as small as this one? It's the same. It's copy-paste. But let me take the B and paste it somewhere here. Do you see the giant? In, sorry. Do you see the giant in the back? That's the same trash can. It's physically equal, but it looks much larger to you. You can make more, more, even more fun examples. Do you see me here on the science festival in Belgrade? And you see the group of my collaborators here. They look, they look really small. You might wonder I'm working with the small people, right? They're students. They're, they're not that small. But, but we can flip. Now I look very, very small, right? It's called bouchette chair. And it's actually changing your perspective to make you estimate sizes wrong. Your size estimates might be quite wrong based on this. So let's put some religion into it. For our guest from abroad, Saint Sava is a very famous saint in Serbia. He, 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 we know him for a long time. We have a huge temple in the center of the city. And trust me, you saw the illusion, but you were never aware of it. When you finish the lecture, please go outside, take a walk. It's a nice night, and you'll see an illusion. I'll explain it to you. When you go to Slavia, fortunately on this painting picture, we don't have the fountain yet. Uh, if you look at the temple, do you see how the temple is small compared to the Slavia Hotel? It's really small, right? But when you go back... When you go back to Knez Mihailova, to, to, to the, somewhere at the beginning, to Terazia, do you see two of them now? Now, Temple of St. Sava looks almost the same as Hotel Slavia. Please take a look at this animation. You see how it's getting bigger? And now it's getting smaller. Just compare the two buildings, you see? You can see it again. Imagine the most famous church in Serbia. It's growing bigger as you move it further away. What actually happens? That's the point where we need the mat. This is a lot of research done by this by our professor Dan Todorovic, and I'm going to talk about his results with you. You'll, you know this from school, right? It's a triangle. It's a nice triangle. You could do some calculations with it, and nobody actually understands them. What's a tangent? You divide the two parts of the triangle. You get some numbers. But it's a very, very useful formula for our perception. You will calculate the tangent of this angle by dividing size and distance. Imagine this is you. This is St. Sava Temple. And this is your distance from it. You can calculate the angle based on the distance and size. Now, what happens? This angle here will decrease if you increase the distance. You see? This is the temple, and this is you going backwards, away from it. And look at this angle here. It's just dropping down. But it's not dropping down linearly. It's not like every bit of it going down. It's just suddenly going down, decreases suddenly, and then it kind of uh, calms down. Do you see the function, how it decreases? you understand it? Yeah, people don't like graphs very much, <laughs> but they're kind of a funny. So, what happens when you come close to St. Sava and Hotel Slavia? Imagine these two buildings. Temple, Hotel Slavia. This is you on Slavia Square. Roundabout, sir. And when you go further away, these are still two points. Temple and St. Sava uh, and the Slavia Hotel, sir. Look at the angles. Delta is the angle between you and temple, and here is the delta. Delta is much smaller here than here, right? Same happens with the angle beta, which comes from the Hotel Slavia and you. It's also smaller here. So you say, what, what, what's the problem? Both angles are smaller when I go further away. But look at the function, how fast do they go down? You see how delta comes down? It's between you and temple, and look how beta comes down much faster. There is a point in which both decrease, but 
delta angle decreases slower. The angle between you and Saint Sava Temple. So what happens? At certain points, those two angles are the same. You see the point when they are the same? But when you move further away, delta becomes even larger than beta. You see? Here in this part. Which means actually that the difference between two is increasing. Regarding beta, delta actually enlarges from time. Let me get you back to the photos. No more functions, I promise. Maybe a little bit more later. So, Hotel Slavia Temple. These are photographs taken from three distances. I can place the distances here, you see. There is the temple, these are the hotels, Slavia, Resovska Street, and there's the near the, the, the court. So, when you look at the temple, these are the three points in which you are standing. Look at the angles from the first, from the second, and from the third point. So what actually happens, our mind judges size based on the angle. As you go further away, temple stays larger than Hotel Slavia because the angle stays. Did I make myself clear? Yeah, thank you very much. It's not over yet. We just tackled religion, people. Now we're going to go even further away. I will ask Ben to join me. Yeah. <laughs> I won't do anything to you, trust me. So, he actually sings Sting pretty well. I heard it recently. Uh, and he will start now. I don't know if you know the song. It's people kind of uh, usually... Uh, experiences as romantic and as because every breath you take, Ben will guy is always watching you, but it's really a scary song. Just imagine everywhere you go, somebody will always watching you. Do you know the guy? <laughs> Not the band, but the guy. It's Tito for those for, for the younger ones. He's always watching you guys. Tell me, Sashka, where is Tito watching? You, where, where is Tito watching? Somewhere there. Does anybody have the feeling that Tito is watching at you? Please raise your hands who believes that Tito is... Guys, he's dead for a long time. He's watching all of you at the same time? <laughs> it's true. It's true. Thanks, Ben, very much for this help. Please, Ben. Even better than the sting. I, I don't think the, the Ben is a really lucky guy. He, he is standing in the circuit. Ben, you know, Ramones used to sing from here like many, many years ago. But now, <laughs> you have the, 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 the luck to do that. I, I'm going to show you one more thing. Now I'm going to start playing like Eminem, you know, the rap music. I don't know how to do that, but please stand up. Please stand up. <laughs> stand up. Now, I'm going to ask you to do a funny thing. Look at Tito. He's watching you, right? Now, everybody, move to the left. And he, look at him. He's following you, right? He's still watching you. Yeah. Now, move to the right. And look at Tito. He's watching you, guys. He's following you wherever you go. It's scary, right? But trust me, it can be even scarier than this. I'm sorry for all those juvenile kids. I didn't know they will be here to put more scary pictures. Everybody's watching you guys. Please. Where's he watching? He's watching you, right? He's watching you. He's watching all of us guys all the time. Take care of yourselves. Why are those guys watching at us? It's actually not called Tito effect. It's not even called Av effect. It's called Mona Lisa effect. It's much a nicer picture. Do you recognize the eyes? Don't worry, it's not his eyes. It's her eyes. Her eyes, do you see the eyes? They are the same. Trust me, they are the same. You don't trust me anymore. Colin, they're not only not trusting you, they don't trust me anymore. So, the eyes are the same. Trust me. But look at the first Mona Lisa. Where is she looking? It's you, right? But look at the other Mona Lisa. Where is she looking? Ah, she's looking there, right? There she goes. 
And look at the third one. She's again looking at you. How did they manage to do this? She's not lying, don't worry. Why is she looking at you? Because we perceive the gaze direction based on the position of the pupils and the position of the head. When the pupils remain on the same place, but I change the position of the head, there goes the gaze. But when I change the position of the head, but also change the position of the pupils, she's looking again at you. It's called the Wollaston effect. What will happen in the mirror? What will geometry tell us about the mirrors? The images in the mirrors are inverted. If something stands like this in the mirror, it will point that way, right? So, you see the Mona Lisa. This is myself. This is how I see myself. And if gaze direction would be a physical object, imagine the red line. She's looking at me. Where she would look in the mirror reflection? In my mirror reflection, right? If direction is here, in the mirror it should point there. So, she would look at me. But that's not true. In the mirror, Mona Lisa and all those guys are always watching at you. Why? Look at from the art history, some famous people. They are all looking at you. When I flip their faces in mirror images, they are still looking at you. They are again looking at you, and again looking at you. Why are the mirror images not respecting the geometry of the mirror reflection? Because the ratio of the pupils in the head direction is the same. Why is Mona Lisa always looking at you? Because whenever you move, pupil position and the face direction are always the same. So she's always looking where the painter told her to look. Every painting will always look at you if she looked at the camera when she was filmed or painted. Do you get the point? Okay. Because the position of the pupils at head direction actually make you do this. So I just tackled geometry in two examples where our mind respects them or respects them not. So I'm going to go a little deeper into the math. Imagine this task. This is you. Do, do you recognize yourself here? Yeah. This is how you look when somebody takes a photo of you from, from, from the skies, right? The head, the eyes. Just imagine somebody, some evil psychologist, puts a pair of lamps. You see these small light bulbs here? They're not light bulbs, <laughs> but in, in the agricultural experiment. And what a scientist or a psychologist can ask you to do. He can ask you to place them in two parallel rows. Easy task, right? You're standing on the table, looking, and you're placing the dots on two parallel rows. Easy, right? But you know what would you do? You would do something like this. Parallel, no problem. But people tend to do it like this. You look parallel. Okay, funny example. But what if you would ask people to do a bit different task? Don't make them parallel. You don't mention parallelity. Make them to be separated for the same size. Distance between them to remain the same. It looks the same as the previous task, right? Parallel or same distance between them. Do you know how people behave? They behave completely opposite. <laughs> so parallel, they put like this. Equidistant, at the same, they put like this. What's wrong with you guys? What's wrong with people? Why do people do it? Because you wouldn't believe parallel and distance, these full lines are distance alleys. That's why they're called, if you make them equidistant. They are equal but just in one specific type of geometry, which our intuition knows best. We call it Euclidean geometry. It's a geometry of a flat surface. If this is you, you still recognize yourself, right? Yeah. You're a bit darker now, but it's still you. You lost the eyes and everything, but no, it's just your hair. So, 
you look at two straight lines and you say, okay, they are parallel and they are equidistant. But that's if the geometry is so-called Euclidean. What happens if you do the same task on the ball, on the sphere? It happens that on a sphere, geometry tells us, parallel lines lie outside equidistant lines. What if you don't do it on a sphere, on a flat surface, you do it on a saddle? You know the saddle? We don't ride horses anymore, we have the cars, but you know what, you, you watch Western movies, right? Sometimes. So, if you do it on a saddle, just imagine the surface like a saddle, parallel lines will be inside equidistant lines. This kind of geometry is called hyperbolic geometry, and it turns that it actually reflects behavior of our subjects, that is people. Your mind, in judging parallelity, behaves not like everything around you is flat, but like everything around you is saddle-shaped. Trust me, it's quite weird, and don't pretend you understand it, even I don't. <laughs> I don't think anybody understands it totally. But, did you see the graph? People actually behave like this. It means that our mind doesn't estimate things as being flat which is intuitive to us, and we learn it in school. And the last thing I'm going to mention to you is actually how far is the sky? You see, sometimes we follow geometry, sometimes geometry lies to us, sometimes our geometry is weird, it's twisted, it's hyperbolic. Wow, <laughs> sounds fancy, right? I need to use some fancy words, I'm a scientist. So, hyperbolic geometry, meditative, hyperbolic. But sometimes, we even have more bizarre changes. Imagine if somebody would ask you, how far is the sky? You know that the sky is not a material object. You learn it in school. But your eyes have no problem in judging how far the skies are, right? I can even ask a bizarre question. How long is one meter? <laughs> you can use beer to measure it. There is a thing at the beer festival, it's called one meter beer. But is the one meter same in front of you and above you? It looks normal, it is, right? One meter is one meter in physics. But not in all physics, but in most of the physics, it is. How about in our head? And I'm going to get you back to the comic books. You can learn a lot from comic books. People, remember what fears the most Asterix and Obelix. Do you remember what is the ancient fear of the ancient gods? They feel that the skies will fall on their heads. For some reason, they don't fear that the sky will attack them in front, but from the above. Why? It actually has something to do with this. I don't believe that Uderz and Goscinny had this idea of making the comics, but I will tell you how do you perceive distances in front or above you. This is the way you do it. This is you. No, sorry, it's not you anymore, it's, it's me. <laughs> Just imagine this is you. The white arrows are actually physical distances. Blue arrows are your perceived distances. The red one is actually the difference between the two. What happens is actually that skies look much further to you than it really is. Although there is no what really is, but when you look above, things look much further away than they really are. Our actual vision, not only that behaves funny, in estimating sizes, distances, in using perspective, our vision became, behaves even more funnier because in, it interacts with other information which tell us, is our body straight or is it laying down? Because our vision changes all these things and geometry and everything if you move around. Why does it do so? I will tell you something. It has to do with your actions. Why? Why is our mind elongating distances above you? Why would it do so? This is just an assumption. Quite good assumption, I believe. Because reaching upwards requires more effort. Let's go back to the rock and roll. Do you, just imagine the kid from Nirvana album, never mind, reaching to grab one dollar. It's reaching, the nasty gravity is pulling down, and he needs to put some effort into it. 
But imagine that the dollar is up. He needs to reach, but the gravity is still pulling down. This movement requires more effort. We call this heuristic. It's a basic assumption that our mind comes with. Why? Because your eyes deliberately lie to you. They are telling you, up is further, reach harder. Because you need more effort. Because the final aim of our perception is to perform actions. That's why it behaves funny. So to conclude, geometry sometimes, it's not healthy, it helps. It's, it's an error, sorry. <laughs> but in other cases, it makes our perceptions wrong. But what is wrong? I'm not trying to behave as a politician. <laughs> what is wrong? We all know what is wrong. But we still vote wrongly. But what is wrong in perception? The aim is not to make verbatim copy, one-to-one -one copy of outside reality. The aim is actually to design such a model in which our actions will be successful. That's why Euclidean geometry is not necessarily good to describe our perceptions. Because the final aim is to design such space in which we will behave uh, more precisely. And this would be the end, except I have one more slide. Because I actually couldn't resist, you know, a psychologist in the great room of Student Cultural Center. A lot of people following him, and I couldn't resist of hypnotizing you. Would you like to do so? Yeah, please let me hypnotize you. Don't worry. What I would like you to do is to stare at this point in the center for 30 seconds. I will count. Just stare there. And when you finish, when I say now, just please look at your hand. But stare at certain point in your hand. You guys in the first row, you can stare at my nose when, when it's finished, OK? OK, we can start now. Go. Now. Don't vote for him. No, I'm joking. <laughs> just stare here for 30 seconds, OK? Now, now it's seriously, we're going to start. 30 seconds, OK? One, two, go. Now, look at your hand or me. Is it it's getting bigger? <laughs> it's distorting, right? So if you didn't stare long enough, you can do it again when we finish. But what happens? Not only that your geometry works in funny ways, I can adapt it for something getting smaller. And when you look at something stationary, it will enlarge. And instead of the conclusion, I will actually leave you with the Nice quotation of David Bowie, who I'm started with. Thank you for your attention.